So up next is Mark Ware doing a talk on research and management strategies, pros and cons of different application techniques. And a little bit of background into Mark. Before joining Rainbow Ecoscience, Mark spent over 10 years in the industry, including eight years with the National Tree Care Company, gaining experience in general tree work, utility forestry, as well as plant health care. He's excited to further the professionalism, knowledge, and reputation of other arborists and the entire industry. His educational background is in landscape construction and ornamental horticulture. Mark is a resident of Pennsylvania, and his hobbies include travel, photography, and camping. His favorite tree is the Copper Beach, and if he were hosting a dinner party and could invite any three guests, he would choose Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, and Chris Farley. It's a solid choice of people right there. So thank you, Mark, for being here today. And with that, I can go ahead and uh, you can take over. Right on. Hey, Thank you, Eric. Before you get started, can you hear me, Eric? Yes. All right. Uh, just a gentle reminder if you did not submit your ISA certification number when you signed up for the webinar, maybe there's a few of you in one room, please put that in the QA only one time. So if you've already done it today, you don't need to do it again. But if you have not put it in the QA box, please do so. Additionally, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box as well. The chat gets really confusing and we start, we tend to lose things. So thank you. Go ahead, Mark. All right. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, uh, I always get a kick out of, uh, you know, I get to hear all, all of Paul and Eric's great credentials and then you guys get to hear about how Tommy Boy is my favorite movie. That being said, we are going to learn something here together this afternoon and uh, we're going to have some fun doing it. So we're going to talk about research and management strategies today. Uh, specifically for the spotted lanternfly. And uh, once again, my name is, is Mark Ware. I'm an arborologist here at Rainbow. Uh, basically, that means I do customer support, um, field support, field training on all of our, our protocols, our equipment, and our products. Um, we can just leave it at that. Once again, uh, as Allison just uh, stated, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. That just helps us keep track. That way we can make sure we get any questions you have answered. Uh, we don't want to ignore anybody. So today, what we're going to talk about in this presentation is, and there may be a little bit of repeat um, after the first two presentations, but bear with me, uh, is we're going to be talking about our treatment options and the research behind them. We're going to go over the considerations and the applications of each of these treatment strategies. And that way, with the end, we'll be able to recommend management options based on our clients or our, our area's pest tolerance. So once again, just to really quickly review what we've already learned in the first two hours of this, um, some key distinct, distinctions around spotted lanternfly is that it has led to grapevine mortality uh, it's also led to Atlantis mortality, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and it is primarily uh, considered a nuisance pest, uh, especially in our landscapes. Other, other times we've hear, heard of it uh, referred to as a plant stressor as well. Uh, they also have very different life stages. And those, during those different life stages, it's going to feed on different uh, parts of the plant as well as different plants in general. Um, they prefer specific hosts at specific times. And when we get into our management considerations, that's an important uh, differentiation. That's We need to keep that in mind when we get into management. Uh, and then, of course, it is spreading very rapidly, and it is very easily to move accidentally. Um, quarantines are in place, and measures need to be followed. Uh, we have great options such as transtect and transtect infusible, which we'll cover in a bit, uh, as well as foliar options uh, by fenthrin um, to control our nymphs. Uh, treatments should be based on client tolerance, which we'll get into. And once, and this is kind of a newer thing that we're seeing here is populations are fluctuating significantly from year to year. So with that being said, just because you didn't have a high population last year doesn't mean that you're off the hook this year. Uh, they will show up as, as Paul had in that one graph, uh, August 3rd, all of a sudden, Boom, they were there just like that. Um, so they can show up very fast and um, their populations can fluctuate significantly. 
Um, a couple other questions I saw a little earlier, uh, so I just threw these in very quickly. Uh, it was covered pretty well, but some of the damage it does, this is why management's important, right? Uh, while it is a nuisance pest and while it is a plant stressor, um, because of the damage it does, it's still important for us as being in the ornamental landscape and the ornamental arboriculture fields, people want the reason we have jobs, the reason people call us out is because they want to use their yards, they want to enjoy their yards, they want their plants to look good. And the simple fact is that the damage that these things do, while it may not lead directly to, to plant mortality, it certainly lessens the, the aesthetic appeal, as well as the usability of our clients' landscapes. And that's a big deal for a lot of people. So while we don't want to be going out and saying we need to spray every tree every single time, we do want to make sure that we are are treating this thing at, as what it is and that we are, are satisfying our clients' needs and desires to, to, to have usable and enjoyable landscapes. So with that being said, um, a couple of the big drawbacks are these things come in like a plague. They come in in very high populations. They will cover the trees. You can see in those top couple pictures there, that is for most people a very not comfortable site. They don't like seeing that. As well as uh, in orchards, especially, you can see that honeydew with the sooty mold that's growing on it on those apples. And so that's a big deal. There's a lot in my area. I just live here in Philly. We have a lot of the, you know, pick your own orchards where the, you know, the public just comes and that's a big deal. So when the fruit doesn't look good, people don't want to go and pick their own fruit anymore. So it's significant economic impacts as well, not just because of the, the impacts it has on the plants. Um, additionally, the impact that it does have on the plants are because of that sooty mold, the, the plants that they're feeding on, as well as any plant matter that's underneath of them, gets covered in sooty mold as a result of the honeydew that they secrete as they feed. Um, as well as you see some, you get a pretty nasty smell in high populations. It doesn't smell pretty. And it opens up our plants and trees to secondary pests. The biggest one being, especially on maples, uh, is ambrosia beetles. And they will come in, they can sense that that tree is under some sort of stress and it, it's, it's weaker and then they will come in and attack. And those secondary pests absolutely can and will lead to mortality in certain situations. And so uh, those are some of the considerations in why we would be treating this thing in an ornamental landscape even though it's not a, you know, leading directly to tree mortality. And finally, um, it, it's got impact on properties and the usability of those properties, like we talked about. That sooty mold is nasty and you don't want it on your nice cars. You don't want it on your play sets or on your deck or on the, 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 the uh, grill that you're cooking dinner on. Uh, so it's really disruptive to the use of our landscapes and it really can, can it's, it's annoying, even, even without all that, just these things flying around, uh, they are, they're poor navigators. So while they may be a little bit stronger flyers than we initially anticipated, uh, they will jump and fly right into your face. Um, believe me, it's happened quite a bit and it's, it's not fun. Uh, it's pretty annoying. And so uh, the disruptive activity of these things by themselves can be an issue. And last but not least, the honeydew does attract stinging insects like wasps, hornets, yellow jackets. And guess what? For those of us who have been out in the field in the fall, they are already aggressive um, in the fall, meaning the, the uh, yellow jackets and hornets. And so uh, they're already angry. And, and being that now we have these, this honeydew that's all over the trees from the spotted lanternfly attracting them, once again, lessens the usability and enjoyment of our landscapes. So uh, a few of the host plants, um, Paul had a, had a much more uh, significant list and, and this doesn't cover all of them by any stretch of the imagination. But what I wanted to cover on this list and what I wanted to drive home with this list is the fact that you can see that there's host plants that they feed on as nymphs, as well as host plants that they feed on as adults. And with the exception of a few, there's not much overlap. For right now, the only two hosts that we're seeing uh, full life cycle feeding on is grapes and, and Atlantis, the tree of heaven. 
Other than that, they, they pick and choose which hosts they feed on at particular times. And once again, this is important as we get into our management. Um, as far as timing and when they're in these, these different instars, uh, this in, in general, this may, may change as the range expands into different climates, uh, different areas. But for right now, in general, we're looking at first through third instars. We're in second going into third instars here in Philly. Um, and that's going to be happening May through June into early July, where we start to see that red coloration as we get into the fourth instar. Uh, in August, we're primarily in the fourth instar, and we'll start to see adults towards the tail end of August and into September. Um, and then we'll see the adults. The adult stage of this pest is really long. Um, a lot of our other pests, the adult stage is weeks. Uh, whereas with this one, basically, we're going to see them in the adult stage from early September through the first or second really hard frost, which is, is what's going to ultimately knock them, knock them out. Um, that being said, their feeding is primarily going to happen in the month of September, maybe early October. And after that, they're primarily mating and laying their eggs. Um, so uh, Tree of Heaven is, once again, that's one that we're going to, there's a little bit of focus on that, um, not because it's particularly a desirable ornamental tree, but it has definitely been shown to be one of their main hosts, one that they are on for all of their life stages. And so um, I, being able to properly identify this tree is important. Um, and understanding that if you have clients with properties that have wood lines uh, adjacent to them, that, you know, especially if Tree of Heaven's in that wood line, that you, you may have higher populations in those properties because of that. Um, there has been some talk early on about how that, you know, spider lanternfly may need to feed on Atlantis in order to complete its life cycle. That is absolutely not the case. That has been debunked. And uh, it just happens to be one of their preferred hosts, which makes sense because it's an invasive from the uh, same area that, that spotted lanternfly is native to. Um, so what I'd like to cover now is some of the research that we've done with uh, some of our cooperators, some of which we heard from this morning, actually, um, and go through why we recommend what we recommend. Uh, one of the key uh, core values here at Rainbow is we want to make sure that anything we're recommending is backed by science. That's really important to us. And so before we get into, you know, why we, you know, why what we're going to use and, and why we're going to talk about. Uh, the research we've done prior to recommending all this stuff. Um, so uh, Dr. Bittinger and Heather Leach, they did a trial on uh, foliar treatments. And, and what they found basically, as you can see, is these things are really easy to kill. Um, just about all with the, ex uh, the exception of Spinosad and Spire Tetramat had really, really good efficacy on killing these adults. Uh, keep in mind now that this is zero days after application. Now, when we look at our extended control uh, and our residual control, we can see that bifenthrin all of a sudden sticks out. And that is why bifenthrin is one of the, the contact insecticides that you mo will most uh, commonly see used, um, at least by professionals, in order to combat and manage populations of spotted lanternfly. You can see that with uh, by fentanyl, we're getting three to four weeks of, of efficacy of residual activity, whereas, you know, with a lot of these other ones, we're getting maybe 10 days to, to 20 days. Um, so by fentanyl, far and above, has the highest residual activity. Um, for systemic treatments, uh, Dianteferon has been the clear winner. Uh, it, it's been that way uh, since early on. Um, this is a graph from a trial that we conducted with uh, Dr. Uh, Phil Lewis from the USDA. These trees were treated with Transtech infusible at the one and a half mil per inch rate, uh, as well as Transtech at a systemic bark rate of 12 packets per gallon. And the way we collected this data was we had tarps that were placed underneath the trees, and we counted the number of dead lanternfly that fell on those tarps. Uh, as you can see, both Transtech and Transtech infusible. Uh, provide a great systemic control uh, against the lanternfly, resulting in thousands and thousands of dead lanternflies. And that's always a good thing, dead lanternflies. Uh, a couple of pictures from this trial. Um, on the left there, you can see that was the injected tree, and, and we have some of the adults that are there. 
on the right, you can see uh, four hours after treatment, if you look closely, you can see that there's already quite a few adults um, laying out on that tarp. So very quick as well. Um, now, one of the things we hear a lot about is, and, and questions that I get personally is, is how come I can't use Zytec or how come I cannot use imidacloprid for this? And the answer is you can't, it's not necessarily you can't, but um, based on this, this work that was done in Korea and by Penn State, imidacloprid has been found variable, inconsistent when it comes to efficacy. Uh, in 2020, we worked with Eric Day, who we talked, who we saw this morning, uh, and Virginia Tech and compared imidacloprid using the highest label rate for soil application against the highest rate for tree injection against the standard rate of Transtech as a bark spray, uh, as well as the lowest dose rate, one mil per inch of Transtech infusible. We did the same tarping method that Dr. Lewis used in the previous trial and tarps were placed uh, and evaluations began at six weeks after treatment. You can see that Transtect and Transtect Infusible are working immediately and over the length of the trial are highly effective treatments. Imidacloprid treatments didn't really start working until about 10 weeks after treatment and were simply inferior to the Transtect treatments. With imidacloprid, we have to keep in mind that there is quite a significant uptake time to get that product into the crown of our trees. And because of this extended time uh, and the lower efficacy rates that we saw anyways, uh, that that my guess would be why if you when you look at Penn State's list, it, it has imidacloprid as uh, variable or inconsistent. I forget exactly what verb they use there. Um, that being said, a lot of people say, well, how come I can't just use it earlier in the season? Why can't I just put Zytec down in April? And that way, uh, you know, it has its two to three months to get up into the crown and I'm good to go. And the reason for that is, is once again, it's variable consistency as far as, as the efficacy goes, as well as that's when a lot of our plants are blooming. And we don't want to be applying neonics, which Zytec and Transtec both are, when we are when plants are in bloom. Uh, that's why we're having this issue with you know, regulations being, being passed around it. Uh, and lots of uh, legislation in certain states around neonics, especially because of, of misuse. So that being said, our hands are kind of tied in, in, some, in some hosts where we can't use imidacloprid because of when we would have to apply it and being at the wrong time and basically applying it against label, uh, as well as having a significant impact on our pollinators. So Keeping that in mind, uh, right now we are still looking once again at Transtech and Transtech Infusible Dynatefron products. Um, many of uh, our state treatment programs, they want to start a little bit earlier. Uh, and so in 2020, we worked with Dr. Jim Stifel on Tree of Heaven to see if early treatments with Transtech at the 12 packet rate and, well, and Transtech at the one mil per inch rate would last the entire year or the duration of that season. Uh, so we treated these trees in May, and beginning in August, we placed mesh cages around the trunks. Um, lanternflies were placed inside these cages, and they were left for seven days. Uh, and then we have the percentage here of lanternflies that were killed. Uh, the results show that both the, the, the bark spray and the infusible treatment provided control for at least five months. And what that means is that we can start a little bit earlier in May or June and still have effective control of spotted lantern fly through the duration of the season. In general, most people I find are doing it in July because that's when a lot of the product things are, are slowing down. We're not doing as many fungicide applications um, and we've kind of gotten previous control of a lot of things. And so in general, in the industry, July is kind of a slower time. So that's why, you know, whether you do it in May, June or July, you will see efficacy through the remainder of that season which is really good news. Um, keep in mind that this is the high rate of Transtech uh, for the bark spray. So we are using that 12 packet per gallon rate. Now that we have seen kind of the reasons why we recommend what we recommend, we're gonna get into our management strategies. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the tools we have, the timing, and then what expectations we should have for these treatments as well, because that's an important uh, key. Uh, we're going to go over uh, some of the management tools, and there's our uh, awareness, tree removal, egg scraping, tree banding, foliar sprays, and then systemic treatments. 
when it comes to awareness, as, as, as both Eric and Paul have, have previously alluded to, educating your clients, educating the public, talking to people about this pest is super, super important. We saw the maps of the potential spread of this thing. We've seen how fast it's spreading already. We've seen how it's spreading. Uh, you know, on trucks and, you know, RVs. And, and that's what's going to contribute to the, the, the longer, you know, the, the large scale spread of this over the next few years. And well, for the remainder of the time it's here, really. And so talking to the, the clients about it, talking to the public about it, if you have to, you know, make it personal, tell them like, hey, if, if this thing gets to certain areas, your wine prices are going to go through the roof because guess what? It tax grape vines and wines made out of grapes. Uh, you know, so make it, you know, applicable to them, make it real life, um, but encouraging them to, to go through the proper steps, even as just a homeowner, in order to control this thing it is really, it's important. And so that I wanted to put that in there as, as one of our management techniques, because it really is. Um, one of the, the reasons for that, and, and we can, we're going to breeze through this, but because of what, what we've already learned, these egg masses will be laid on just about anything. Um, they will lay two to three egg masses, 30 to 60 eggs per mass. So you just transport, you know, a, a few egg masses and you've potentially taken uh, a couple hundred of these spotted lanternflies to wherever you went on vacation in May. <laughs> um, and uh, one thing to note here as well, in this bottom left picture, you can see uh, we have a picture on the left is spotted lanternfly. On the right is our, uh, excuse me, spongy moth, um, both of which are an invasive and impactful pests. But uh, that is the closest lookalike. Uh, I think I saw a question earlier about any other egg masses that may look similar to spotted lanternfly. Um, and while spongy moth is definitely not a beneficial, its egg mass is still very similar um, to what we're seeing with spotted lanternfly. So uh, a key distinction there. Uh, once again, uh, as we've seen this, the, they will lay their eggs on anything, sidewall tires. They seem to like rusty metal um, for whatever reason. I, I know personally, that's where I've seen quite a few of them. Uh, I've seen them on on but I've, I've seen them on everything. Uh, you can see camp chairs here, um, decks, shipping pallets, uh, even uh, cushions to outdoor furniture, which is kind of funny. Uh, my favorite one here is the light bulb. Uh, it just that's just strange. Uh, but you, like I said, you'll you'll see their their eggs laid on everything, and so that's why we're seeing this spread. Um, you know, especially with trucks and trailers and things like that. So um, one of the biggest things we can do from a kind of a cultural or maybe even mechanical method, because uh, we want to be coming at everything, whether it's by a lantern fly or a scale or, or whatever, from a, from a toolbox approach, from an integrated pest management approach. And so we want to be utilizing a couple of these different things. We don't want to just go right to transtech or right to dinotefin, right to chemical control right off the bat. Uh, we want to be using a combination of a bunch of different methods to control this thing. Uh, and that's what's going to give us not only uh, better results, but but make us more responsible as applicators and uh, practitioners in the field. So one of the big things is getting rid of your tree of heaven. Uh, like I said, they're not, an, I mean, for most people, they're not an ornamental tree. They're not a nice tree. They grow in crappy areas and, and they're weak wooded and, you know, they're just not a nice tree. That being said, I have seen them as specimen ornamental trees in landscapes. It's kind of weird and it throws you off, but they're out there. Um, but whenever possible, whenever agreeable by the client, getting rid of those trees is, is important and it's, it's, a, it's a good step to take in managing your populations. One thing to note with Tree of Heaven especially is when you do cut it down that you need to treat it with some sort of herbicide. Uh, triclopyr is one of the best ones we carry sightline. And what this does is it prevents it from re-sprouting. If you've noticed, Tree of Heavens, they grow in groves. They, they grow in little colonies. And so they do easily and quickly and readily re-sprout from stumps. And you can wind up with a worse, you know, with a larger population if you just cut them down and then leave. So treating the stumps uh, with triclopyr or a similar herbicide will, will go a long way. 
egg scraping. This is another one you see all over the place. People want to, you know, they talk about, hey, you know, scrape the eggs off, destroy the eggs. And that is a fantastic idea. Um, when possible, when they're within reach, uh, you know, you can use, uh, I wouldn't recommend a credit card, you know, at least not one you want to use, but, you know, using a card of that style to scrape them off the bark and into some sort of uh, alcohol hand sanitizer works well and destroying those egg masses. Uh, while that may not make a huge dent on your populations, it is important. And that's what we're going to have to do if we do find them on our vehicles, on our campers, on our lawn furniture, et cetera. Uh, scraping those eggs off and destroying them is, is key. What you're not going to want to do is send a climber up into a tree and tell him to or her to go up and just, hey, I, I'm going to need you to take all the egg masses out of this tree. That's not going to work. Uh, your climber is going to hate you. Um, the client's going to be like paying way too much money. It's just not going to be effective. Uh, you're not going to find them all. Um, but these egg masses will be laid throughout the entire crown of the tree. Um, even though the majority of them are usually in, you know, the bottom 10 feet or so. Um, that being said, we have many, that's when we want to get into our chemical controls, uh, spraying at 3% oil. It can be effective against, against egg masses and things of that nature. Uh, another one we see a lot, uh, and, and then we'll see in the news and you'll see people doing is, is tree banding. And while tree banding is, uh, I would say it's rather effective against nymphs. Uh, when you have any kind of significant population, what winds up happening is uh, the nymphs just cover these bands up. So if you don't change them regularly, um, it becomes ineffective fast because these bands will get filled up with, with dead nymphs. And then the rest of the nymphs will just walk across the back so their buddy's there and get where they're going anyways and won't be trapped by it. So if you're going to use tree bands, there are definitely some considerations. I consider these things more as a, a scouting tool. So if you're in an area where maybe you had a low population last year, or you're just on the edge of a quarantine zone, or there's been a few hitchhikers found in your in your area, and you just want to monitor and see what kind of population, if any, you have, tree bands are a fantastic tool for that. As far as a control method and a management method, uh, I would steer clear of these as for that reason, uh, or at least for that reason, uh, using them by themselves. Uh, I've seen birds. I've seen squirrels that have been impacted by these things. In other words, they've been stuck to them and uh, it's not a pretty sight uh, as well as they're going to get our other pet fish. Uh, they're, you know, they're not, it's not going to be just the spot of lanternfly trap. Um, so uh, sticky bands can be uh, helpful. Uh, one thing, if you are going to use them though, because of the fact that birds can be affected by them, other mammals can be affected by them. I know most people don't like squirrels, but you don't want to see them stuck to a sticky trap either, <laughs> or at least I don't. Um, but caging them, so putting a cage, some sort of mechanical barrier so that the lanternfly can get through and stuck to them. However, um, some of our other, uh, I know, keep kids away from it for, uh, for crying out loud, you know, even if that's all it is. But putting some sort of barrier there to, to use them safely is, is going to be key. Um, and then we get into our chemical controls and, and um, you know, these are, are where we're gonna really start to see significant management and significant control of our spot of laner fly. So uh, for foliar sprays, we're gonna start off, if you remember back uh, by Fenthrin was the one that we, we settled on because that's gonna give us not only very quick and immediate knockdown, but it's also gonna give us the longest residual activity. So we have Bifen XDS. We're going to use that at a 12.8 ounce per 100 gallons of water rate. And then we have Upstart Gold, which we've used at a 21.7 ounce rate. Uh, we're going to get contact kill, and we're going to get three to four weeks of residuals. And this works great on both nymphs and adults. Um, for example, you know, most people say, well, why would I use Bifenthrin on adults if, if I can use other things like uh, that are systemic and lower volume? And the answer to that is, like we talked about, these things will show up in incredible numbers. And I've literally seen and gone out to treat trees that I, you know, I was going out to treat these trees as a, with a bark spray, but I couldn't get to the bark because of the number of spotted lanternfly that were covering it. And so I actually had to do a contact spray first to knock that population down off of the bark so that I could actually get in there and do 
my systemic bark spray treatment. Um, so, you know, ironically enough, they will they will actually prevent you sometimes from doing certain treatments. Uh, so whether you knock them off with your hands mechanically or brush them off or whatever, um, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, some things to consider though, is while we do have great residual, it's very cheap compared to some of our systemic options. Um, there are obviously concerns and considerations we need to take into uh, consideration when we're talking about foliar sprays, especially by fentanyl. And that is, they're going to affect our beneficial populations as well. Uh, it's a broad spectrum insecticide. So spraying wide swaths of the landscape will not just kill spotted lanternfly. It's also going to kill our beneficials, potentially bees, butterflies, and all those other insects that we do sometimes enjoy seeing in our landscapes and that we don't necessarily want to kill or manage. Um, multiple sprays of bifenthrin that are performed as Mosquito control treatments have led to outbreaks of scale of mites. And so uh, we're, we're knocking the ecosystem out of whack as well by doing this. Um, once again, in other words, another thing too is that foliar sprays just to the general public are concerning. Um, while Roundup is completely different, right? It's an herbicide versus an insecticide. The general public may not understand that and may not know that. And so they see all this stuff in the news, they see it in papers, they see it, whatever, on Facebook. And so they just kind of equate foliar sprays to bad, even if they're not, <laughs> even if we're doing them for all the right reasons and we're doing them responsibly. Um, public perception can be bad uh, and we can be under a lot of scrutiny. Um, so for that reason alone, sometimes uh, there's, there's certain companies that aren't using glyphosate anymore for the simple reason of public perception. Um, and so that can be a drawback and a concern that we take into uh, account. Um, finally, many times the right-of-way corridors, for example, along railroad tracks, along highways, along power line cuts, um, they are they follow waterways, right? And bifenthrin is very highly toxic to fish and other aquatic organisms. So if we are going to use them in those areas, we have to use extreme care and make sure that these waterways aren't impacted by uh, anything we're spraying or, or any spray drift that we may be creating by using these products. So just some things to keep in mind around bifenthrin. I don't wanna scare you off from using it because once again, it's an important tool in our toolbox, but there are definitely some things we need to consider before we start using them. Uh, when we get into our systemic treatments, this is, this is the fun stuff. This is what I love. This is exciting, uh, you know, it's kind of high tech and um, it's low volume. And so the reason that systemic treatments are so great is because once they're in the tree, they're only affecting the pests that are feeding on the tree. And so we have a lot less impact on our beneficial um, populations. We're also using them at a much lower volume. And so our, our chances of spray drift and affecting, you know, organisms and, and you know, other things that we may not want to affect go significantly down, as well as we have much longer residual with these systemic treatments than we do with our spray by fentanyl treatments. Um, so uh, the the Dynatefron product that we carry and that we use is is Transtech. It's seventy percent Dynatefron. It's carried in water soluble packets, which you can see there on the bottom right. And so not only is it low and low volume and low impact when we're actually applying this stuff, but it's also low impact when we're, when we're measuring it out and when we're mixing. Because it's all contained in these water-soluble packets, we have much higher dosing accuracy, as well as much lower uh, potential um, uh, exposure as, as an applicator, as somebody who's mixing these things um, versus other formulations of diatefron that are out there on the market. Um, it's, it's sprayed as a, or it's applied, excuse me, as a basal trunk spray. So what that means is we're going to be spraying this at a, at a low volume, low pressure at the lower four to five feet of the trunk. Um, and our rate is 12 of these packets per gallon of water. Um, we're going to mix in some sort of surfactant like pentrabark or scrimmage at two and a half ounces. And what that's going to do is give us faster results, as well as on trees like red maple that have a slightly hydrophobic bark, it's gonna help us with penetration and uptake. 
Uh, this product is absorbed through the lentils of the tree and taken up through the vascular system that way. So anything we can do to help absorption is just going to give us a little bit more confidence in our uh, control method there. Um, USDA, as, far as, as well as state treatments, uh, they are all, not all, but most are using uh, TransTech specifically. Um, treating, once again, in July, or as we saw, uh, we can treat a little bit earlier if we need to. Uh, but treating in July is going to give us really good control of those fourth in stars and adults. And those are the ones that are really causing issues. We also have 24C labels that are available at um, three to, uh, for a variety of states. Um, pretty much most of the Northeast states, uh, we have uh, 24C labels, as well as in New York, which allows us to use um, TransTech on Tree of Heaven for spotted lamb or fly. Um, so, um, the way, oh, and uh, yeah, here, here's the, uh, the states as of, uh, earlier this year that we have 24 C labels and what this 24 C label enables us to do is apply, uh, it, it raises our acreage restrictions, right? So normally when you look at a label, it has, it'll have some sort of pounds per acre restriction on it. Um, and so with spotted lanternfly, we're finding because we're using that higher rate and we're usually doing multiple trees is it's easy to meet that rate. And if we're not careful, it, it's rather easy to exceed it, um, which we don't want to be doing. And so by having this 24C label for these states that are listed there on the right, it enables us to then uh, basically triple that rate. And we can put three times down as much three. We can put up to three times more product down per acre. Um, as well as um, in New York, once again, we're just being able to use this in New York for Tree of Heaven on Spotted Lanternfly. If you are using this 24C label also, it's important, make sure you have it with you. <laughs> um, and that sounds kind of silly, but um, if, if, you're, if you're going above the regular labeled acreage limit because of this 24C, make sure you have the label with you or a copy of it. Um, once again, TransTech is great for proactive and just-in-time treatments, provided that you can get enough of it onto the bark and it's easy and accurate dosing. Uh, once, real quick, to go through kind of how you would apply it, just to show you how easy it is, we're going to be doing this at low pressure, 15 to 20 psi. We're applying it to the bottom four to five feet of the trunk, um, and we're going to be putting about one and a half to two ounces per inch of solution onto the tree. So really easy application. Uh, if you can count to 12, you can treat for spotted lanternfly. Then we have TransTech Infusible, and this is our micro-injected, micro-injectable root flare injection product. So this you can put through things like the Q Connect or other micro-injection devices that are out there on the market. It's labeled for one to four milliliters per diameter inch. Um, we have effectiveness at one mil per inch. Um, the nice thing with this is we have no acreage limits. We can use it near waterways and, and uh, other sensitive areas, you know, maybe public, public areas uh, with even further reduced exposure than our trunk sprays because it's all contained going directly into the tree, right? From whatever injection device we're using directly into the tree. Uh, and so there's you know, some really big pros to that. Um, some considerations that we must keep, we have to keep in mind are that it, it does require drilling into the tree. So we are, you know, mechanically damaging the tree by drilling into it. And so maybe on certain species that's less desirable than others. And fortunately, there are systems out there that utilize uh, lower impact um, methods, uh, whether it be plugless methods or whatever, and so that it, it's, it's that tree is able to compartmentalize and heal very fast from these injections, uh, as well as they do sometimes take a little bit longer to uh, apply through that root injection method. But once again, uh, the benefits of this is we're getting uh, low volume injection, one mil per inch, fast uptake, really fast uptake, um, it's the highest injectable concentration as far as active ingredient goes, and it's all contained from the time it's in our reservoir, in our injection equipment tank, until it's into the tree. So uh, especially for applicators, that's nice because your exposure is very low. 
Uh, as far as timing goes, when to apply these treatments, um, this is a nice little chart, uh, and it's actually available in our spotted lanternfly management guide. And also contained in this management guide is, is what we like to call our, actually, I don't know what we call it, um, but it's kind of a, it's a, it's a nice little way to go through management and, and how to determine and talk to your clients as far as what are their tolerance levels. Is it a high tolerance client that, you know, they don't really care if they don't really mind the insect. Uh, you know, maybe they just have a few high value trees, some important trees that they want to protect. Is it a medium tolerance, which is probably what most of our clients and most of the people we deal with are in. And that's somebody that they don't really want to see this pest. They want to make sure their landscape is usable. Um, but if they see a few of them, it's not a big deal. And then we have our low tolerance clients. And those are the ones that they just hate this thing. They want it gone. And those are the, you know, those, all three of those have different strategies that we're going to enact when it comes to management. Um, things to consider when it comes to management is, is the treatment option. What time of year is it? What stage of life are they in? Are there any site restrictions? What plant material? The reason we, we I wanted to show that nymph uh, versus adult slide where it showed the hosts is if you show up at a client's property in May or June, early June, and they're still in that first through third instar stage, you can see them on roses, you can see them, I see them on magnolias, you can see them on all of the, a lot of the perennials. But by the time they're to their adult stage and actually causing damage, they're no longer on those plants. And so if we go in May and June and we treat the plants that we see them on, we're treating plants for no reason, right? Because by the time they're into to damaging levels, they're not, they're no longer on those roses. They're no longer on those magnolias or what have you. And so um, keeping in mind that, that depending on the life stage, they're going to be feeding on different hosts. Um, other things to consider uh, as I wrap this up is client expectations. Uh, once again, what are their valuable plants? Do they use that patio ever? Do they really care about it? Um, they may, they may not. Um, driveways and sidewalks, walkways, parking areas, uh, playground areas, all things to consider and to look for when we're considering treating for this nuisance pest. Um, and so really it's, it's what, I, what I'm trying to drive home here is it's talking to your clients about what they care about, what they use the most, and then um, molding our treatment, uh, our management strategies around that. It's not one size fits all. It's not like we can go to every client's property and we know that we have to treat every single red maple. That's not the case. Um, are we gonna be treating most red maples and most of the hosts that they feed on as adults? Probably, but it's up to the client. It's up to how they use their property. Um, and with that, I'm actually gonna finish it here. I had a few more slides, but we don't need to, you know, it's, it's just kind of, elaborating on this a little bit and I just want to leave a little bit of time for questions so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and Eric if you want to just let me know what questions there are yeah thanks for that Mark okay so we got a couple questions and I don't think we're gonna have time to go through all of them but uh some of the ones that we aren't able to get to I think uh these will be great candidates for the, the panel that's gonna be coming up right afterward. Um, but the first question we have is, does the research indicate that insecticide use on tree of heaven, as opposed to other species or high value trees or plants will yield the greatest impact overall spotted lanternfly populations and impacts within specific locations? It's a mouthful. In a, in a nutshell, yes, uh, because spotted lanternfly is one of those hosts that they're on for their entire life cycle. They're definitely one that that the spotted lanternfly prefer. They're definitely a preferred host. Um, you know, based on that logic, going through that logic, by applying to the tree of heaven, we're going to see basically the most bang for our buck, I guess you could say. In, in other words, the, the most kills for the, the product that we apply. Um, and that's only because they are generally found in much higher populations on Tree of Heaven versus some of their other hosts. Sure. And uh, this is from Alan as well. What are the impacts of the use of the highly effective insecticides for spotted lanternfly 
on other insect species that may also be present in or near the trees or plants being sprayed. So I'm going to assume by highly effective, we're talking about our systemic um, dinotephron treatments. And when it comes to uh, dinotephron, it, it's going to be a much, much, much lower impact oh, on beneficial populations when it's applied responsibly at the right time of year and by the label. Um, we can certainly see unintended consequences if we're using these, these products at the wrong time of year before bloom, for example. So if we're going by the label and we're applying them responsibly, then we will see significant decrease in effects on any of our beneficial populations or pollinators. Perfect. Um, and last one, uh, uh, if you answer, and then some of the rest of the questions we'll go ahead and uh, have for the panel. But uh, Ben, Benjamin Rose indicated, what was the mixed spray rate for the bark spray? I thought you said one and a half to two ounces per inch. So the to, to mix it, you're using a 12 packet per gallon rate. And then once you have that mixed solution, the amount of that solution that we're putting onto the tree is one and a half to two ounces per inch of diameter. So if you have a 20 inch or a 10 inch tree, let's make the math easy here. We're going to be putting 15 to uh, wait, hold on. Yeah, 15 to 20 ounces of solution onto that tree. Yeah, and um, a, a good metric to kind of follow if you're doing some of these systemic bark sprays is one gallon of ready to use solution can generally treat about 65 to 85 inches. Um, so if you're me uh, measuring out product for kind of a, a long day of doing treatments, that's a good metric to abide by. And you can kind of check yourself along the way as you're doing some of these bark sprays, maybe you're covering, you know, 60 inches and you look in the backpack and you have about, you know, half a gallon left. It might be a good indication that you might be under applying that. So you can kind of get some of those spray rates down. It, uh, it takes a little bit of practice, but generally, you know, spray to drip. Yep. So.